Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. The season as it unfolds presents to us today this image of the Holy Family. Such a precious, precious feast that we have today. I was reminded of something that happened to me a long time ago. It was when I was first ordained. Two things had occurred in a pretty short period of time. The first one was I was asked to visit some of the homebound parishioners. And on my list was these two names. I remember them to this day, Richard and Felicia. Richard and Felicia were in their 90s and they were homebound. And so the first time I went to visit them was the beginning of September. And not shortly after I got there, Richard leaned over to me at, and said to me, in two weeks, we'll be celebrating our 70th anniversary. I don't know how many of you have ever met anybody who's reached 70 together. I've heard of 50, 55, 60. This was the first couple I had ever met in my life that had made it to 70 years. And I was so dumbfounded that I looked at him and said, so how did you guys meet? <laughs> he told me the story. It was, it, he was, it was such a charm to see the twinkle in his eye begin. And he began to tell me the story of how she was on a rebound relationship. And, you know, he was looking, he had just come home from the military and he was, you know, looking and his parents, the, their parents thought maybe if they could just get together and they brought him to the dance. And the next thing you know, history took its course. But he was able to tell me of a, of a life. And remember, this would have been a life that went through a depression. This was a life that went through world wars. This is a life that went from, you know, nobody having phones to everybody having phones. I mean, this, this was just like a revolutionary kind of an individual, if you would. And he talked about so many of the different things in their life. Talked about the good times, of course, but also talked about a lot of the difficult times. Times even when they were kind of at each other's throats over the fact that there really was no money and there was problems and they didn't even know if they were going to be able to feed the kids. And then he was talking about, but how they did this together. Somehow they were able to work it out and they always found some way to basically land on their feet. And as their love progressed, as their life progressed, he began to think about it. And he started to, to realize that, you know what, it's like he even said at one point, he goes, you know, we used to argue a lot. Now we don't argue it anymore because we know how it's all going to turn out. So we just get right to the end. And so I just said one more question. I said, would you do it again? And with a twinkle in his eye, he said, you bet. Seventy years and he treasured the entire bit of it to the point where he would do it all over again. That impressed me so much. Then I was asked by the pastor to work with the family mass committee in the parish. And so at the very first meeting at the family mass committee, one of the things that the committee wanted to do was try to highlight families of every type. Now, as a newly ordained, I really had no idea what they were talking about, to be honest with you. So I pressed a little bit and they said, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, all the different types of families that are out there. I said, I still don't know what you mean. What do you mean? In effect, they wanted to try to find different families that were in different situations, that were going through different things. Some that, you know, maybe the loss of a spouse and you have a widow there, or maybe, you know, family that broke up and, you know, and all these different things. And they wanted to highlight them all. And I said, you know, sometimes we do need to applaud the heroic efforts that some people do put in in this world. How faith does see us through. And so we tried to emphasize that and do those things but having thought of Richard and Felicia in the back of my mind, I said, but where do they fit in to this model that we're creating? Because they were heroic in their own way. And I believe sometimes we need to be very, very careful, especially as believers. We need to be very, very careful because there's this danger we have of normalizing our brokenness of trying to make normal what is really not. Christopher West said it beautifully. He says, our society has gone out of its way to normalize our fallen nature. We are a fallen people. Adam and Eve sinned. From that moment forward, marriage and the family became a trial. Go read the book of Genesis. It's very clearly in there. Being human beings brought with it now a trial. But one of the things that is so salient that is so beautiful when you read the scriptures over and over again. And if you haven't done the Bible in a year, it starts tomorrow. Hint, hint. Throughout the entire Bible, you see it over and over again. All of these familial images, marriage and the family, 
over and over. And believe it, if you think your family's dysfunctional, read the Old Testament. You will find that there are plenty of broken situations, plenty of strange things that happen in the families. So it's not that it's something modern or new. Brokenness has always been there, but it's never been accepted as normal. I want to be careful because I know there's a lot of people who struggle in heroic ways to take what has been put on their plate and make a good meal out of it. And con con congratulations. Wonderful. Keep striving to keep good where something has gone wrong. I'm not saying anything against that. But what happens to the ideal then? Do we start to lower the ideal so much where people begin to think everything is OK? There is no real norm. Look at some of the discussions our world is having today over what constitutes marriage in the family. And yet from the very beginning of time, God had an ideal. God put together an ideal that he wanted us to try to strive for, a home that we could all live in, even with its struggles, even with all of the problems and things that may come along, to strive for holiness. The one universal call, the Second Vatican Council said it beautifully, the one call that is universal to all of us is a call to holiness. Now, if you ask me right now and say, the family that I grew up in, was that a holy family? I'll tell you, absolutely not. We were just as dysfunctional as could be. We had all, all of our problems. There were a lot of ills in our family. There was, and even today, many of my, my cousins and my relatives still struggle. It's there. I get it but it still can be holy. It still can be holy. And that's why I treasure this feast, because this feast speaks of family, of the holy family. Now, we can look at the holy family and say, well, you know, Mary had it pretty easy. She was preserved from original sin, even though she didn't know it. And Joseph had it pretty easy, well, because he had Mary as his wife. I mean, how much easier does it get for a guy, right? And they both got Jesus, the Son of God. So they had it pretty easy, right? No, see, we, we, we sometimes want to paint it that way. But think about it. There's a king out there right now waiting to kill this baby, threatened by this child that Simeon just proclaimed would cause that kind of division, who is going to, by fiat, his own order, have dozens of children slaughtered trying to kill him. Imagine that on your conscience. They have to flee to a foreign country with a baby and have to live in this way, in fear. Now, let's face it, for, for many of us, we sometimes turn that fear, those problems, into, I'll be polite, we turn it into sniping. We snipe at each other. Husbands and wives don't like the way things are going, so what do they do? They take it out on each other. Fighting begins. Sometimes I, I feel so bad because the situation gets to my desk, but it's too late. The hurt is so deep and, the, and the, the, the pain is so profound that it's really hard to try to heal it. It's not going to be healed overnight. And so I always say the same thing. And I say it to the young couples when they get married. You've got a whole life ahead of you. But there's one thing that you need to do as a husband and wife for the rest of your lives. If you truly, truly want to have a loving relationship, every day I tell them, Every single day, you have to put it on your calendar. And you have to, let's face it nowadays, if you don't put it on the calendar, it's not going to happen. Every day, you've got to slip off. And for a husband and wife in particular, go into your room. You're going to close the door. You're going to turn off the TV. You're going to tell the kids, don't interrupt us. You're going to put away all the noisemakers. Everything gets shut down. And the two of you go into your room and pray. Hold hands, look deeply into each other's eyes, and pray. And I say to them, I'm only going to put one condition on it. And as you pray, keep this closed. Because this is what causes the problems. Pray from your heart. Let your souls connect through the eyes to the soul, uh, to the windows to the soul, through the eyes. Pray for each other and thank God every single day. And I say to families too, at some point when the kids come along, family prayer is essential to helping us heal the hurts before they get bad. Family prayer is essential 
to us coming together and allowing God's grace to fill our homes so it's a place of welcome, not a place of woe. That it becomes a home that is radiating the light. See, here, here's the thing. The Christmas season is loaded with this imagery of light at a time when we're experiencing physical darkness, much less emotional or, or um, physical darkness. God wants to radiate in us. God wants to radiate in your families. God wants to radiate through you and through your families. And what better way to do that than to have God at the center of our families. God is the main character, Jesus Christ as our brother. Look at the language we're going to use in a little bit. Our father, our mother, Mary, Jesus, our brother. To have them very much as the main characters in our family. Here's, the, here's one of the real problems that I see happening today. Father Mike Schmidt said it a couple weeks ago in a homily, and I thought it was brilliant. He said, our biggest problem today is we have this thing called the main character syndrome. I'd never heard of it. The main character syndrome. He said, social media is encouraging us to make ourselves the main character of our story. We're always telling stories about ourselves. And he says, and it's getting so much and so prevalent that people are just now so self-centered and so self-focused that unless you fit into my story, I don't want you. But he's really tapping into something that was beautifully said by then Karol Wojtyla. He was the archbishop in Poland who became the pope. He had said it in a book called Love and Responsibility a long, long time ago, back in the 50s. He said the problem that he's seeing already coming out of his communist state in the secular world was the problem of people living in their ego. Harmony happens when my ego is happy, when my ego is satisfied. And he said, and now we started to see that this starts to happen in relationships. So it becomes an egoism. So long as my ego is happy, we're good. And then love gets reduced, he said, and it gets well reduced to what's called a harmonization of egoisms. So long as I'm in harmony, you're in harmony. So long as my ego is happy, your ego is happy, we must be in love. Now, all of you who have been in a marital relationship or in a family relationship, do the egos always sink 100%? Of course not. There's always going to be a disruption to that harmonization because that's not love. That is not love. That's why the main character has to be the love, God himself. That's why the main character has to be Jesus Christ, our brother, who shows us the real way to take up the cross and love. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, today we celebrate a holy family, a true holy family that wasn't put there as an unrealistic ideal, but as a perfect example of saying there are ways to work it out. There are ways to care for the other, even though it's inconvenient for me. There are ways to make sacrifices for the other. There are ways to lay down my own desires, my own wants, my own um, self. But that's how it has to happen. That's the way it truly happens. So I know you want light, don't you? You want light in your homes. You want light in your families. And even though some darkness creeps in every now and then, work on getting back to the light. So practical things that we can do in our homes. When you feel the tension rise a little bit, ask yourself, what could I do different? How can I do it differently? How can I be light in this moment rather than sniping or, or snipping or going back at the other person? How can I, in this moment, invite them to an encounter with Jesus Christ? Let's just say a quick prayer. Let's just calm this so that we can see what's most important. I guarantee every newly married couple that if they can follow my advice and say that prayer every day, that at the end of those 10 minutes, guess what? Guess what? At the end of those 10 minutes, all the stuff that you thought was so important when you started, all of the things, whether they were good or bad, happy or sad, all of that stuff will melt. They will all disappear because Jesus will do what Jesus does. He'll say, that stuff wasn't what was important. And what will resurface once again is love. The person that you love. You will give yourself to the person that you love. We need to have some sort of an ideal to strive for because we are imperfect. We are tainted. We are hurting people. 
and darkness does creep in, but it can never win as long as we bring the light of Jesus Christ to every single moment. And so be light. Be followers of Jesus Christ. Be filled with that joy of Christmas, that true joy. No matter where you're at, no matter how things are going, wherever you are right now, whatever's going on in your life, whatever the situation in your home, bring light to it and just go from there. There are heroic people at every level, in every situation. Be that heroic believer in Jesus Christ. That's what makes all of those different situations work, is that there's a heroic person in love with Jesus Christ. And when we make him the center, no matter what the situation, light will shine. So let the light shine. Can we work on that, please? Little by little, place by place, supporting one another, helping one another, caring for one another, because that's how we do it. That's how we as Christians can reform the world, by starting in our homes. Welcome home, my dear brothers and sisters. Merry Christmas.